So it is, it's good to be here. Um, <clears throat> Paul is here to share with us uh, as part of the series uh, that we're doing on Who Me. Uh, we're interviewing some people that are doing some pretty extraordinary, extraordinary things through their uh, ordinary lives. And uh, Paul's got a really cool story to tell us. If you guys have uh, read in the latest Connect magazine, uh, we hear about Tarori's project. Paul, could you tell us about Tarori and how this project came to be? Hmm. Well, uh, you, as Andrew said, you may have seen it in the Connect magazine. Tarori was, here's the book here, um, she was a young Maori girl um, who was at a mission school over in uh, Waharo near Matamata, and um, she was about 12 years old, and uh, while she was at the mission school, she had learnt to read and write te reo Maori. Uh, they were under a sort of a, a threat at the time. Uh, the local tribe there was under threat from a tribe from Rotorua. So they decided to move the mission school over to Tauranga for protection. And while they were on the move, they got to the bottom of the Kaimais there and they were going to cross over a track. They were attacked. And um, it was about, I think, 12 or 14 in the group. And Tarori was killed in that attack. Um, and around her neck, she actually had a, a, a gospel of Luke in Te Reo Maori, and it, she had a little kitty bag around her neck. And the the warrior that killed her took that um, book, the gospel of Luke, from her, thinking it was uh, of value and he could trade it. He took that back to Rotorua, where it sat on a shelf for about 12 months. And then... Uh, they captured a, another slave from uh, another tribe, and he'd been educated at the Paihia Mission School, and he'd been educated in Te Reo and English, and he could read and write both Te Reo and English, and they asked him if he could read this book. And so he read the Gospel of Luke to the Te Arara people in Rotorua. Um, and when they heard that story... They became believers in Jesus and followers in Jesus. That had there was a, a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit uh, just through reading the Gospel of, of Luke. They let the slave go, and he travelled down through the North Island, and he ended up near Otaki with uh, at the par of Taraprahā. And uh, most people in New Zealand know of Taraprahā. He was a very famous um, uh, chief, warrior chief. Uh, and this slave read the Gospel of Luke uh, to the people there, and um, through that, Taraprahā's son and nephew became believers in Jesus. And they then went out and spread the Gospel amongst their enemies. And in the meantime, uh, the Tiara uh, from Rotorua went up around the East Cape and by word of mouth spread the Gospel up around the East Cape. The guy that killed Tarori came back to Wahara and asked Tarori's father, who was the local chief, for forgiveness for killing his daughter. So what happened, there was just a profound move of the Lord through the Maori people throughout this country. And um, when the which which brought peace to many of the tribes. And when the missionaries arrived Two to three years later, they had found that a lot of the, the Maori tribes had become believers in the Lord Jesus. It was just it was a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit through mm. through the land. Praise God. So mm. what's the Tadori project about? What are you guys trying to do now? Um, so what happened was I had spent a lot of time doing prison ministry, um, almost 30 years, and uh, through that... Um, I always felt that we're kind of the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and that we need to be a fence at the top because we were seeing a lot of Maori guys in prison and, and they, were, they were wanting to change their lives. And so it came to me, and I believe the Lord brought it to my attention, to put the gospel of Luke and this Tarori, story of Tarori in a book and... Um, get it out there, because back in the 1830s, it had such a profound effect 
upon the Maori people. I just believe that if we could get it out there into the Maori community again today, the Lord would divinely intervene as, uh, once again. And so we found uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke in both uh, Te Reo and English, and we found Tarori's story written by Joy Cowley in a, in a children's book. So we've put the two together, and this is the end result. Mm. And we had 10,000 printed, and to date they've all gone out just by word of mouth. Wow. And we're hearing back now of just the amazing things that are happening with this book. Mm. Yeah. Great. And so 10,000 are already out there? Yes, and they've all gone out. The plan? And we've just ordered another reprinting of another 20,000. Wow. So uh, it... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it does have a. It has been having a, quite a profound effect. Awesome. Mm. That's wonderful, and it's so great to hear. Mm. Uh, we love hearing good stories. But how can we be involved? Because it's something that would, you know, some people here might be yeah. keen to be involved in some way. How can we be part of this? Firstly, uh, the most effective way you could be involved is to pray for the project. Uh, that's a key. Um, we need prayer. And, and, and also, I just want to thank all of those who have been involved so far uh, because um, quite a number of people have come on board of the vision and they have provided the funds to have these printed and, and the expertise to have them printed. And it's been quite a big job. Uh, so I just want to thank all those who have been involved so far. And the other thing, if, any, if the Lord leads anyone to feel that they want to uh, support the project financially, they can just give to Bethlehem Baptist Church Mission Fund and just code it Tarori Project, um, and that will help have these books printed. Great. Mm. Awesome. Hey, well, thanks, Paul. Thanks for mm. sharing the story. It's, uh, it's a privilege, really, to be part of God's wonderful work, isn't mm. it? And so it's um, great that you're taking this on and you're obeying the vision mm. he's given That's to good. you. So yeah. I just want to pray for you. Thank you. Oh, thank mm. you. Heavenly Father, I just really want to uh, thank you for Paul and for the vision uh, you've laid in his heart. Uh, but more than that, Lord, we know and we just thank you for the work that you do through your uh, Holy Spirit and using the scriptures with or without us uh, to change lives. And Lord, we just uh, praise you for the wonderful work that you did uh, amongst the Māori community uh, so long ago. And we just really pray that the uh, resurrection of this story and uh, that the Tauri story will just really resonate once again with the Māori people particularly, but also for all of us, that, that this mm. story will just, again, uh, pronounce your name and glorify your name uh, through this uh, land. And Lord, I just really commit to Paul and, and to the team that's working with him, and, and for the needs that they have, Lord, we just commit all these things to you and, and give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. There, there is uh, a number of these books out in the foyer, so if you are interested, just take one. They uh, they're free. Awesome. Mm. Hey, let's give Paul a big round of applause. Eh? Awesome. Thank you. Well, that is a great story. And the story uh, that we're hearing today is from another person of the Bible that, uh, in many ways, like Tarori, was, was just a small player, but in such a major, major movement of God's work in this world. And I'm very excited to be uh, sharing with you this morning about someone that we don't maybe know too much about. And in fact, I can guarantee you we don't know much about them. But we're going to learn today just how committed people, regardless of how small they might be or uh, insignificant they might seem, is uh, how a committed person can make such a big difference and how God uses people who are willing to give uh, everything to him. But before we get into the story, I do want to... Um, am I pointing at the wrong direction? Turn off, is it? Yep. Again, hey, the on-off button. I'm struggling with that today. Here's a question for you. Is there anything that you're not willing to give to God? Is there anything good? Not anything, like, bad. Is there anything good? Is there anything good that you're not willing to do for God? Is there anything good that you're not willing to give to God? Is there anything good of yourself that you're not willing to be for God? It's a question I'd like you to think through, and we're going to come back to this as we go throughout uh, this next uh, little while. The story I want to take you through before we meet our person of interest today uh, starts with Stephen. Stephen was a deacon in the early church. He was a wonderful evangelist, 
And he was not afraid. He was a person willing to stand up and be counted for his faith and belief in Jesus Christ. The stories and the, the uh, evangelism, the, the preaching that he did was inspirational. And we're going to pick up at the very end of his life. And if you want to read more about uh, just one of the things he spoke about, then read about this whole chapter. Go and read this whole chapter, Acts chapter 7. But we're going to pick it up. He's just gone through in Acts chapter 7 a wonderful history of the biblical story, of what we read in the Old Testament, of the Jacobs and the, of the Abrahams and the Isaacs and Moses. He gives a really, really amazing brief uh, recount of the Old Testament story. And he comes through to Jesus Christ, and here he is, and he's on trial, and he's talking to the people here, who are, trying to, who are putting him on trial. And he gets to the point here where he's, I think, as he's built himself up, he's got himself to a point of not really caring anymore about what these people thought about him. And we're going to hear uh, one style of evangelism, which we probably don't take out too often nowadays, but we're going to hear the story of Stephen, and further on we're going to meet the person that we're going to talk about. So let's just uh, read through this, this part. This is, again, at the end of a very good sermon, or a very good uh, recount of the Jewish history. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Has anyone used that as part of evangelism? No, not too often. Oh, you have. Oh, well done. Yeah, that's right. I was there that day, yeah. Um, Interesting. Um, Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered the ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he had said this, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. That day, a severe persecution against the church in Jerusalem, uh, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house. Dragging both men and women, he committed them to prison. Stephen has been killed and they laid their coats at the foot of a young man named Saul. And here's Saul, a young man trained up by one of the greatest Jewish rabbis, passionate about upholding what he believed to be the Jewish right, the Jewish law. And he ravaged the church by entering house by house, dragging over dragging off both men and women, he committed to the prison. And as he committed them to prison, he sent them to trial. And as they sat in trials, Saul voted to have them killed. This was a period where Saul, over the period of about six to twelve months, terrorized the church of Christ. He was passionate about taking out every single believer in Jesus Christ there was. For six to twelve months, he went house by house, taking women and men, getting them to prison, seeing them on trial, and trying to put them to death. For the period of six to twelve months, the Christians were scattered and were absolutely at fear of what this man and his band of followers were doing to them. Saul was a devastating terrorist at that time. Legally, in their minds, but he terrorized the Church of Christ. And they fled. All this time, Saul was breathing down the necks of the Master's disciples. Out for the kill. 
he went to the chief priests and got arrest warrants to take to the meeting places in Damascus so that if he found anyone there belonging to the way, whether men or women, he could arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. He set off. When he got to the outskirts of Damascus, he was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light. As he fell to the ground, he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? He said, who are you, master? I'm Jesus, the one you're hunting down. I want you to get up and enter the city. In the city you'll be told what to do next. His companions stood there, dumbstruck. They could hear the sound but couldn't see anyone. While Saul, picking himself up off the ground, found himself stone blind. They had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. He continued blind for three days. He ate nothing, drank nothing. And this is where we meet our man for today. A man called Ananias. There was a disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias. The master spoke to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, he answered. I reckon at this point, expecting a nice, nice conversation vision with his master. Get up and go over to Straight Avenue. Ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus. His name is Saul. I reckon at this point Ananias would have turned green or white or something. Go to the house on Straight Street. Go to the house of Judah and ask for a man from Tarsus. His name is Saul. All I can imagine is Ananias asking the question that we're talking about in this series. Who, me? Who, me? Ananias is a disciple, which was translated a follower of Christ. He was not a leader. He was not anyone of significance. We've got ten verses about Ananias in the Bible. And God chose him to do this. And I'm sure Ananias is going, who, who me? I think if I was Ananias, I'd be going, um, no, 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 Pastor Craig. Come on, we, we've got to get Pastor Craig doing a job like this, surely. I know, Pastor Eric, he's, he's a pastoral care pastor. Get, I'm sure Saul needs pastoral care. He doesn't, he doesn't just need to hear from a, just, a, just a normal Christ follower. He needs pastoral care follower. Or maybe one of the elders. I, th- I, think we should send, I think we should send one of the elders to go and talk to Saul. And once getting across the thing of, who, who me? What, why me? I'm sure then, if he's anything like me, the excuse is, oh, oh, I'm, actually, I'm actually a bit busy uh, to do, go over to Straight Street. That's such a long way away, Straight Street. Well, maybe... Or maybe there's a whole host of things that was going through Ananias' mind about why this simple job that God was asking him to do. Just go to a straight street, go to a house, and lay hands on a man. Why it wasn't for him. Now, I don't know about you guys, but there's times that I get asked a question and I just go exactly like this. I just go cold. And, and on Friday, I went to the hairdresser so I could get my hair cut for you fellas. And... And the hairdresser asked me that dreaded question which always seems to put a fright down my belly. What are you doing this weekend? And I'd obviously been preparing for this talk. And that whole initial thing of, oh, you know, it's that question. I don't know if you guys feel it. You probably don't. It's like the Monday question. What did you do yesterday? It's one of those questions that for me has continually given me that initial feeling of that. And I don't know about you guys, but there's been times in my life where I've lied just to avoid feeling something. Thankfully, God's teaching me, and I'm getting over this, but it's just something that we all go through, and I did tell the hairdresser that I was speaking at church on Sunday. And I have had the courage of late to tell people that I went to church yesterday when they asked that question on Monday. But it's just so often when we get confronted with Something that's not difficult, but just makes us feel a bit scared. And I'm sure Ananias felt this way. So this nice vision that he was expecting turned into something um, a little bit tricky. Get up. Go over to Straight Avenue. Ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus. His name is Saul. He's there praying. 
he just had a dream in which he saw a man named Ananias enter the house and lay hands on him so he could see again. Ananias protested, Master, you can't be serious. Okay, Ananias was no different to us. Master, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things he's been doing. His reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem. And now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priests that give him license to do the same to us. You can't be serious. But the master said, Don't argue. Go. I've often wondered about the tone of this. Did God say, Don't argue. Go. But I reckon, I don't see God as an angry God. Just don't argue. Stop wasting our time here. Stop arguing and go. Go. I have picked them as my personal representative to non-Jews and kings and Jews. And now I'm about to show him what he's in for, the hard sufferings that goes with this job. So Ananias went and found the house. He placed his hand on blind Saul and said, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. The master sent me, the same Jesus you saw on your way here. He sent me so you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than something like scales fell from Paul's eyes. He could see again. He got to his feet and was baptized and sat down with them to a hearty meal. That is all that we see of Ananias. We do read one more thing where Paul recounts this later in Acts 22. Where he says, a man, just a man, named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You'll be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what you're waiting for? Oh, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. That is it. That is Ananias done and dusted. Being involved in one of the most crucial changes in our church history. We only know him as a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and a respected person. That's all we know. We don't know anything else about this person. And that's all we read about him. And yet God chose him to do this amazing act. Simple, but amazing. Now I look at all these faces here, like all these faces here, followers of Christ, hopefully respected people, we're simply the same as Ananias. There's nothing more special about him than us, and yet God used him to do a dramatic change in this world. And he wants to do the same through us. What did he ask Ananias to do? To go to Straight Street. To go to Straight Street, find a house, lay his hands on a person. He was a pretty scary person, granted. But the job he was asked to do was something very simple. And so again, we come back to the question, is there anything that you wouldn't do for God? Would you go to Straight Street? Would you simply walk down the street? If you're a giver, if your makeup is a giver, would you give? If your makeup is that you love serving people, would you serve? If you have time available, would you give that time and be available? One of the challenges I've had is our personalities is that God made us a certain way. And would you give all of your personality that you are to God? I was really challenged by that, and it had something to do with rugby. Most things actually have something to do with rugby. Most of you will know that cows, cows, I always think everything's got to do with cows in some way or other. Uh, God's greatest invention, of course. Um, so I love cows, but I also love rugby. And here's a picture of um, 
myself a while ago, back in the day when Edison was cute. Um, long time ago, long time ago. And uh, I grew up in the Waikato, and I just loved the Waikato rugby team. It was my desire to play for Waikato. It was not my desire to play for the All Blacks. I wanted to play for Waikato more than I wanted to play for the All Blacks. I loved the Waikato rugby team. And so I used to go, and, and my aim here when the child was this age was clearly to indoctrinate him and to brainwash him. Okay? He wasn't there necessarily because he wanted to be there. I just wanted him to become a Waikato geek like I was. And I think it worked. Even though we've shifted here and been over here for about eight years, Edison still supports the Waikato rugby team, which is wonderful. Um, but the thing is, what I learned is that when I watch rugby, I get very passionate about what's happening. And when I'm at the rugby, and it was quite suitable when you had a little thing like that, is that when the Mexican wave came around, you could throw up this person and catch them again. And then I learned very quickly that once you finish the Mexican wave, a lot of beer bottles fall down. And so the aim was when you threw your child up, you had to then catch them and then protect them as the beer bottles came down. So the Mexican wave would come around and whoosh, up goes Edison, catch, protect. Do, 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 do. Then it'd go around again and up goes Edison, catch him and protect. And that was, that was a great thing. Now, the other thing is that when people score tries in rugby, is that I did tend to get very passionate about it. And, you know, you'd be uh, sitting down in your seat and you'd be excited, but then they'd make a break. You, that game last night was amazing with that for feet. They'd make that break. I'd be on my feet. I'd say, go, go, go! And then I'd be scoring, and I'd be... It's not actually the same when you're the only one cheering right here, right now. It's a lot more meaningful when there's 30,000 people doing it, but I'd be full-on cheering and yelling. And then the next day, I'd go to church. And I went to wonderful churches, but they weren't the most flamboyant churches out there. And I'd go to church, and we'd sing songs about raising our arms. And then I'd sing the songs that would say, you know, I'll stand um, arms high and heart abandoned. And it didn't take long before I felt as I was a real hypocrite. And so because of that, I changed the words. Instead of saying arms high and heart abandoned, I'd say with voice high and heart abandoned. Because I don't want to be a hypocrite, right? So instead of saying I'm going to raise my hands when I wasn't, I changed the word to say I'll raise my voice. Because I was wanting to do that. And so that got me through for ages, feeling as I wasn't being hypocritical, because instead of singing I'll raise my hands, I sung I'd raise my voice. And then another Saturday I went to see, I went up to the Christmas and the park thing up in Auckland, 300,000 people there. And I remember I was there on the day when Nelson Mandela came out on stage. And at that stage, and I still do, I, I, the admiration I have for that person and what he had to go through. And he went from being in prison to becoming to be the president of South Africa. It was amazing. And me and 300,000 other people all raised our hands and clapped. And I just felt so in awe of this person that I felt quite comfortable raising my hands and clapping. And then at church the next day, hands down, as I changed the word to I raise my voice, I then clicked, God spoke to me, I think, I'm sure. He said, are you not willing to raise your hands for me? Something so simple. You're willing to raise your hands for the rugby you're willing to raise your hands for Nelson Mandela, but you're not willing to do it for me. Something as simple as that. Now, I've got friends and family who are quite different personalities, and when they get excited, their hands move from their pocket to this. <laughs> and that's as good as they get. So for them to raise their hands in church would be quite unnatural and not part of their personality. But for me when I clearly have got a personality that God planted, God planted in me was to raise my hands. The fact that I wouldn't do it for him, something so simple, and yet it was just that piece of me that I wasn't willing to give to God. And then as I stood in church and I had this gospel of Jesus Christ spoken to me for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave everything so that whoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And here I was with my personality not willing to raise my hands for him. See, the thing is, we've got this verse 
For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. And the question I've got this morning for you guys is, do you honestly believe this verse is true? Don't answer that loudly. Because if we believe it's true, then we first of all believe we are God's handiwork. In other words, we should be very comfortable with how God made us. We should not be ashamed with how God made us. We shouldn't be trying to hide it, and we shouldn't certainly uh, keep some of it from him because he made us like we are. We are God's handiwork. God made us the way we are. He made us with the personality to raise our hands, or he raised us, raised us with the personalities not to raise our hands. But he raised us with our personality. He created us for this reason. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We weren't created in Christ Jesus to criticise. We weren't created in Christ Jesus to be judgmental. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We were created in Christ Jesus to walk to straight street and lay hands on a person. We were created in Christ Jesus to do a whole lot of simple jobs, good jobs, good works. That's what we were created for. And God has prepared for these to be done in in advance. God has prepared stuff for us to do. It's not happening by chance. God has prepared in advance. God prepared in advance for Ananias to meet Paul. God prepared in advance for Tarori to have the scriptures over her neck when she came across that atrocious, atrocious situation. God prepared in advance for the right people to see that scripture and to take it to the next people. When Kato prayed before, he prayed about as a church having influence in the people around us. And again, I think in the heart of hearts we believe that. And I think back to the ex church, the church of the early church, where the numbers, it says the numbers were added daily. There's one day where 3,000 were added to the number, but it says after that, that numbers were added to their church daily. Acts 2. And in verse 42, it says why. It says because people were totally devoted to four things. They were totally devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the word of God. They were totally devoted to fellowshipping with one another. They were totally developed to prayer, totally devoted to prayer, and totally devoted to the communion that we've shared this morning. They were totally devoted to these things, and the numbers were added to them daily. And yet I think one of the tragedies of our churches, not necessarily this one at all, but is that there's a range there. How devoted are we? And I just think in the world that we've come into or that we're here in, where there's so many distractions, somehow our devotion to Christ and to these four things is just not what the early church was like. For the church of Christ now to grow and to influence the way that Caleb prayed about, we need to be totally devoted to Christ. He wants our total devotion. He wants everything. Everything and nothing less. Everything of who we are. He doesn't want us to become so busy that we burn ourselves out. He just wants us to be everything of what he created us to be. And sometimes that job is as simple as going down the street to talk to someone or to lay hands on someone. The jobs are not necessarily parting the waters and expecting miraculous things to happen right in front of us. They are often the simplest of jobs, the good works that he's created us to do and that he's created in advance for us to do. He wants us, his handiwork, to be the best that we can be in how he created us. So when we look at this series and we see Ananias and he says, who, me? And as today we might ask ourselves, who, me? Do, am I giving everything? God's answer is, yes, you. Yes, you. I created you. 
You are my handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that I've prepared for you in advance to do. So is there anything? Is there anything that we're not willing to do? God wants to use a people that are totally devoted to him. I just pray that this day, as a church and as a people and as Christ followers, we can, like Ananias, when God gives us the vision to get up and go. Don't argue. Don't argue, says God. Go. Get on with it. You're my handiwork. We're going to sing a song with Tina and Darren. In the song it talks about us choosing to surrender all and to give everything and nothing less. And I'd like us this morning, if you'd like to um, put a stake in the ground today and say, today I want to give everything and nothing less. Today I want God to identify in me if there's things that I'm not willing to give up. And if today you want to say, today I want to give everything, I want to be totally devoted to Christ. Then I'd like you to give that opportunity. And what I'll do is I'll ask you, if you'd like to just make that stand today, then just to stand where you are. After the service, if you'd like to come forward for prayer, then uh, there'll be people up here that'll pray with you. But if you'd like to make a stand today, say, I want to give everything and nothing less, then just, just stand where you are now. Heavenly Father, as we come and stand before you, Lord, I pray that you will identify in us areas that we're holding on to and we're not giving up to you. Lord, I pray that we'll be willing to give you everything and nothing less. And uh, Lord, as we become available to you, I pray that you will speak to us clearly. I pray that you will show us where you have got good works planned for us to do in advance. And I pray that you'll give us the courage, the courage of Ananias to just, after questioning and after fighting maybe, that we'll be willing to obey and to follow. Lord, it is our privilege to be part of your family. It is because you gave everything to us that we can now give ourselves back to you. And we commit to that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.